before we get on with that, let's get straight into it to the show. Jam-packed show for you today, but I want to start off with the most important thing today. And that is Man United won against Brighton away from home 3-0 in the EFL Cup, right? Um, League Cup um, has really... Um, the League Cup has really sort of changed in its sort of importance, I think, now, especially in the Premier League, well, especially with Premier League teams. It also, it, it obviously has to do with money. I think because of the prevalence in money in the league, or prior to pandemic especially, and the fact that a lot of the teams in the top 10 are spending, you know, 20 million, 30 million plus on players. Um, they have aspirations of playing in Europe, whether it's a Europa League or the Champions League, they're not really fussed. And they generally want to create a better product that they can essentially sell to bigger brands and all that malarkey, right? So the Premier League is big business and they've now seen it, they've now realised that it's not just enough to beat in competitions, you need to actually win trophies in order to kind of boost your profile and of course, you know, allow you the opportunity to gain new brand sponsorships. And I think, um, of course, if you spend a lot of money too, you have to kind of justify the money spent um, in some sort of tangible way by winning silverware. It just is what it is, and it? Sports is kind of cutthroat and black and white that way, right? Um, you can say you're the best team, you can say you have the best players, but really the record books are only going to remember the trophies. Of course, the fans will remember the moments, the memories of some of your cult heroes, but at the end of the day, if you want to really create history and really rewrite the history of your club, you really need to have some trophies in the trophy cabinet. So the FL Cup has, um, has kind of regained a an importance that you never really saw in prior years. I think most teams sort of treated it as a need, as a kind of needs must. I do remember back in the day, Portsmouth kind of fielding a completely different starting 11. They would have the fielded in Champions League, quote unquote, disrespecting the EFL Cup in that respect. But you know, if you're Harry Redknapp and you're managing Portsmouth, right, the most money you're ever going to get is facing Man United at home, right, at your stadium during the FA Cup or something on those lines, or having a run at maybe uh, qualifying for the Europa League. Um, you don't really want to bother yourself with trying to win the EFL. But now it's sort of changed, obviously, all the teams are spending money. So, with, t with the teams in the upper end of the table, such as the top four teams, it's gained an even more important significance because there's only so many trophies you can win the league, right? Or in one season. You can win the Premier League, you can win the Champions League, the FA Cup and the League Cup. There's only four positions and there's four very strong clubs plus the ones outside of the top four who can take points, who can make you lose, who can knock you out in um, cup competitions. So it's very difficult to win these League Cups, especially towards the latter stages when um, teams start fielding a lot more, when the better teams start fielding a lot more stronger teams in order to make sure that they win the trophies. And of course, with this match in particular, uh, Man United already kind of... Um, squeakily won against Brighton right 3-2 which we actually didn't deserve to win at all it was kind of a lackluster performance so we were a bit I say for myself as a Man United fan I was a little bit anxious about the game I didn't necessarily think we would um, be able to put Brighton away I, I just thought I always assumed it would probably go to penalties and we'd maybe lose um, but of course, the game didn't pan out that way, and um, and um, to my surprise and to everybody else's surprise, uh, Man United ended up winning three 0 Now, I think some people might had might have had us down for winning. I don't think we had us down for keeping a clean sheet, to be honest. Especially considering how poorly we played in the other match, and considering how often Brighton hit the world work in the other game as well. But um, the changes made to the to the side that faced Brighton were pretty decent. I don't think anyone really complained about the overall lineup. Um, in goal, you had Dean Henderson, who obviously needed the opportunity to play, and somebody that's obviously vying and pushing David Aguirre for number one spot. Brandon Williams, who I'm still not sold on as being a full-back, let alone the left-back, played at left-back. Lindelof, who a lot of people don't really rate, myself included, played alongside Eric Bailly, which is an interesting partnership because I've always maintained that Eric Bailly is the best defender at Man United. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care about the price tags. I don't care who plays for England. At If he's fit, if he's healthy, Eric Bailly is the best centre-back we have. Now, does that say more, more about our center backs and does about Eric Bailly probably but in terms of the ability to command the back line the ability to be aggressive the ability to win balls in the air win balls on a one-on-one -on -one duel play the ball out the back he's the best he's the most well-rounded defender we have bar none and he really kind of makes you question why we even decided to sign Victor Lindelof I know why we did because I'm sure at that time we signed Victor Lindelof Eric Bailly was coming off a spout of injuries we didn't have Harry Maguire at that time we were still playing Phil Jones and Chris Smalling I get we needed the bodies but in terms of the two defenders the most important one is Eric Bailly and whoever you sit alongside him it doesn't really matter but I think if you have Eric Bailly in your back four you are probably all the way there then um, Diego Dallo had a rare start his first start I think since June a player that I think has been greatly disrespected by our club um, in terms of you know he's not great don't get me wrong 
But if you're gonna play Tim Fima first with Mensa and not have Eric uh, Diego Dollar, like I think that I would take that as a personal insult. There's no way you can play Tim Fima Mensa in front of me when you got Diego Dollar in your squad. It just doesn't make any sense because Tim Fima Mensa isn't good. He's not making that standard. I'd, I'd I'd even go as far as saying he's not Premier League standard. He is trash, like horrendous. Right? He's had so many chances to prove his worth. Whenever he has played, he's looked terrible. I'm not sure it's because he's not a right back and should be a midfielder. But regardless of that, he's not a good player. He's not. I, I'd imagine part of the reason why I'd have him in the squad. Is because he seems like a bit of a fun personality. He, he seems to have a lot of friends in football. Like everybody in football, far and wide, um, seems to know who um, Timothy Foster Mentor is. I'm not too sure why that is. Maybe because of his background coming up in Ajax. I don't know. But regardless, he's not a great player. So Diego Dalla getting a rest start was great to see. And then you have McTominay and Fred playing in a double pivot. In front of them, we had Daniel James and Donny van der Beek and Juan Mata. Happy for Danny van der Beek to play. Um, Donny van der Beek, sorry. Um, long time coming. I think... Um, you know, it's only three games in, but it's been concerning that Solskjaer has used him so rarely, especially considering um, how quickly some of our started lineup, especially Bruno fans and Paul Pogba guys, got run into the wall. It would have been nice to see him get rotated more often, but again, it is what it is. Daniel James, obviously, has had a bit of a up and down a United career. He's a player who I still maintain has a use for the team. I just think that, unfortunately, playing underneath Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, a manager who isn't necessarily going to improve you as a coach, He's not the most tactically versatile manager in the world. Um, he's not really going to bring out the best in Daniel James because he's a bit one-dimensional. When you have one-dimensional players, they need to be able to do exactly what they are good at doing and nothing else. Whether that's him running behind the back line, whether that's him sprinting up and down the bar line, whatever it is, he needs to have a, a, a rigid system that he can exactly fit into. If not, he's no use, which is why you see him being linked to places like Leeds with... Uh, uh, with obviously the Leeds manager under Bielsa, you can definitely see him fit in there really well, right? He's small, he's mobile, he presses really well. Um, you can see that working. And of course, Igalo playing in front again, who I again think has been disrespected because whenever he does play, he always have to play with the worst players. He doesn't get to play with the best player, which again, isn't necessarily the fault of the manager. You have to just perform when you have to perform. But hey, here's what it is. Game was a bit shit. First half, I'd say that apart from the goal, of course, from Scott McTominay, uh, great free kick in the box. Was that freaky or corner? I don't remember quickly. Is that corner freak? I think it might have been a corner. I forgot. Um, he heads it in, which he probably should score a lot more headers looking at his frame and how big he is. Second half started off much the same, a little bit slow, but then we ended up scoring a pretty decent goal with Ryan Mata, who was probably the man in the match. And then, of course, towards the end, Paul Pogba, Marcus Rashford came on, up the levels in quality, and Paul Pogba sealed the victory with a um, with a free kick in top corner, which came off a deflection. And the Paul Pogba conversation is an interesting one because he got played a bit more further up the pitch, right? And that's a and that's kind of a criticism a lot of people have had about Solskjaer and his love for Bruno. I think as great as Bruno Fernandez is, there's no denying, in my opinion, again, that I would say the better number eight quote conventional number eight or conventional number 10 out of the two is definitely Paul Pogba the better kind of all around dynamic sort of like box to boxy kind of midfielder would probably be Bruno Fernandes but still I'll say Bruno Fernandes still takes too too many risks for how deep he plays sometimes I think you can take those risks and play those kind of high percentage balls further up the pitch like a Kevin De Bruyne right balls over the top balls from a weird angle trying to force it through the lines right because if you lose possession you know way up you know in the opposition half it's very unlikely they're going to spring attack and punish you every time but if you keep losing the ball in your own half or next to the halfway line you give the opposition more opportunity to score but i would still say in a competent team with a manager that actually has a system where they can rotate players it would be great to see a, a, a team that included um paul pogba donny van der beek bruno fernandez and fred or like a defensive midfielder all in four it could possibly work but you would need a mid you would need a, a manager that's able to kind of um, utilize maybe the fullbacks for the width because you don't necessarily have Luke Shaw and Warren Rekasaka aren't going to be the best people going forward and attacking or you're going to need um, a manager that's able to kind of have the players interchanging in the front in some way but there's a way to kind of get around it but you need somebody with a bit more tactical now and that's not the case that we have now unfortunately with um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer um, again positives are that um, Igalo still looks a bit off it you know which I don't really blame him for I think he's been out too long um, Dalo had some really good moments too um, he, he did he, he did he definitely showed the importance that we need to have actual wing backs that can attack because we don't have any natural width on the wings anymore or as we did in the past I think it, or if you're playing a more inverted system you need to have your fullbacks pushing up 
And if we don't have those fullbacks pushing up and delivering assists or contributing into attacks, we, it's it, you know it's basically pointless having them on the field, really. Um, but yeah, decent match overall, um, decent performance from the players, the best that we can do for this moment. But again, we still need players. We still need probably a defensive midfielder. We probably still need another centre back, especially if one of Maguire or Lindelof or Bay most importantly gets injured. He's definitely our best centre back, hands down. We need those players to come in during the window sometime soon. We've only got a couple of days left, really. So, you know, not really holding any hope on that one. But again, decent performance from us, all all, um, all things considered. And hopefully we push on and win ourselves a trophy because I still think if Solskjaer is unable to get us top four, but wins a trophy, he unfortunately will still end up losing his job. So I don't think he's going to put too much emphasis on the Cups. I think he's still going to try and ensure that we finish as high up as we can in the league, which is no guarantee considering how well other teams have started. But hey, <coughs> you can only hope. You can only hope. 